Now, uh, today I will talk about uh, uh, something I've been working on in the last uh, a few years, uh, which is uh, how we can go beyond the, the pairwise interaction in the paradigm of uh, transfer entropy and in general information theory. So uh, one of the things that uh, plague uh, this uh, subfield, this niche uh, field, I would say, but I think is a common problem is that uh, we tend to call uh, different things with the same name or the same thing with different names. So, so I will uh, be uh, biased and partial in this. Maybe I will uh, forget stuff or omit stuff, but uh, it's in good faith. Anyway, I wanted to disclose this. So uh, let's start uh, with the pairwise interaction. So uh, in um, despite the, the progress in uh, computational power and or maybe because of that, uh, I don't know, um, and also of the type of data that we can collect, uh, we've become obsessed with the uh, pairwise interaction, in particular the correlation, and yeah, also given it uh, a special name uh, like functional connectivity. And so our uh, adhesion symmetrics are made mostly of pairwise interactions. And of course, our uh, graphs and networks, which we love to uh, project on the, on the brain are also mostly uh, made of a pairwise interaction. Now, uh, there has been indeed some uh, effort of going beyond these pairwise interaction and uh, we can start with, uh, with the network part. So the, the higher order interaction is now becoming the, I wouldn't, I wouldn't even say a, a trend or, or a promising or a growing thing. It's actually a big thing already. Uh, we have the higher order representation of the graphs in which uh, we start from the pairwise representation, which we have a graphs and then we have uh, motifs and clicks, which also uh, made already there, uh, found their uh, place in the connectome um, field. And then we have a higher order representation uh, and uh, simplicial complexes and hypergraphs are uh, one of the two of the main uh, paradigms which have been investigating when we look at higher order networks. So there is a, this uh, a recent uh, uh, opus magnum by uh, several excellent uh, and the young colleagues uh, this is a recent review on physics uh, report and is uh, an excellent read if you have uh, a few weeks to spare. So uh, also another aspect of higher order interaction is uh, conditioning, but not conditioning meaning, okay, uh, I know that there is partial correlation. I know that there is a, a conditioning and I have a big computing power and I can condition on all the data set because uh, my computer allows me to do so because uh, this uh, brings to, to tragedies, especially in, uh, when we want to infer uh, causal relationship between our variables. And indeed, the notion of confounders and colliders are very well known is, uh, in, uh, 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 in several fields, uh, namely in, uh, in psychometrics, uh, in the epidemiology and so on. But uh, in neuroscience, it's actually a, problem, uh, a, a big gap in the field. This is a recent uh, conversation uh, by uh, Con Recording and uh, other colleagues, which uh, are all, uh, I would say, main actors in uh, uh, neuro computational neuroscience and neuroscience data analysis. And they actually convened that uh, the notion of a collider, so of a variable which can confound inference, even when we try to condition in it, or maybe because we try to condition it, is something which is often overlooked. Now, uh, inferring uh, motives and clicks uh, from uh, networks, and here I put in quotation marks because also building a network from a addition symmetrics of statistical dependencies is already a quite adventurous exercise. So, uh, and then trying to look for motives then is a bit problematic because uh, there is a common history. There are uh, uh, directed and indirected relationships. So it's not uh, clear what we are looking for. And then the same uh, for the hypergraph. So it's uh, easy to interpret an hypergraph when uh, uh, we talk about uh, a physical uh, a connection or a connection which actually have a cost 
On the other hand, when we talk about statistical dependencies, is uh, is tricky. So the idea is that we try we have to try to infer these quantities from the data rather than first going to a graph and then from there trying to infer them. Uh, so the we can start from what we know about entropy here, this uh, quantity, and try to decompose it in a, a simple case, in the simplest case of a higher order interaction in which you have uh, two uh, three variables in which two of them can be uh, drivers which share some common information about the system and then one target. So this uh, the entropy, which uh, uh, can be also uh, expressed in terms of uh, amount of uh, uh, information, is uh, can be decomposed in information storage. So uh, this reflects the memory and the activity of the target system. Then information transfer, which um, reflects the, the, the pairwise connectivity. Information modification, uh, so the joint information of the two uh, candidate driver variables and uh, some extra or new or non predictable uh, information. So, uh, again, in, we, in, a, in a case of a dynamical system in which we can distinguish between the, the present and the past, we can condition on the past and have uh, a special uh, class of entropy measures, uh, starting with the transfer entropy, which is the let's say, a, a mutual information condition on the past of the driver variables and so on. So we have here the mutual information and then we have the interaction information in case of three uh, variables. So uh, we can uh, further explore this uh, uh, decomposition looking at the formula. So we have the, the present information, which is basically the, the entropy of the system. We have the information storage which is the uh, mutual information between uh, the present and the past of the target system. And then we have the information transfer, which is the information. So how much our um, surprise uh, or our error in the prediction of the target is reduced when we e include something from the past of other time series. And then we have uh, new uh, information. So uh, if we focus on the information transfer, and now we try to decompose this in case when we have two or more drivers, so we start with two drivers, uh, we can decompose this uh, in this uh, way. So the total information transfer can be uh, decomposed in information transfer from uh, driver one and information transfer from driver two, plus some uh, interaction term. So uh, extending the notion of uh, inter um, interaction information to this uh, conditioning on the past, so to information transfer, we see that we can have two cases. The first one in which the total information transfer is smaller than the two individual information transfer, meaning that the uh, interaction information transfer is greater than zero, and we talk about redundancy. And then we have the case in which the total information transfer is greater than the two individual information transfer, uh, meaning that the interaction information transfer is smaller than zero. And we commonly refer to this situation as a synergy. Now we have a case in which uh, redundancy and synergy are, uh, cannot coexist. So we have a net amount of redundancy and synergy. And in, um, in particular in neural systems, when we have a lot of shared information, either by design or by the type of data that we have or so, typically uh, the redundancy always wins over the synergy. So we overlook the, the synergy. So for this, uh, several strategies can be adopted. One of these is the partial information decomposition in which we allow uh, redundancy and synergy to coexist as two uh, separate entities and in which the individual transfer entropy are equal to the sum of unique information plus redundant information. And then uh, from this, we can then define the total uh, information transfer and the redundancy. Since uh, let's say the Shannon theory uh, is not enough to, um, to decompose, to, to, to perform this decomposition, we need to resort to uh, some hypothesis or some postulate. In this case, if you assume the redundancy uh, being the minimum of the two individual transfer entropy, uh, we also uh, 
safeguard ourselves from the fact that the redundant transfer entropy does not depend of the existing correlation between the two source uh, processes. And so in this case, we have two uh, definitions of this expansion. One, uh, when we have a time series and we want to condition on the past, but we can also have a, uh, a, a part in which we do not condition uh, on the past. And so we have, uh, let's say, instantaneous uh, relationship, or basically if we want to condition, for example, across several, uh, uh, several subjects or uh, several quantities at the same time. So we build our probability distribution instead of on the past on different realization at equal times of the same uh, across uh, uh, several samples. So, uh, so far we explored only uh, triplets. What about we want more than uh, triplets? So of course here we uh, quickly incur in the course of dimensionality. So for example, starting from this uh, work by uh, Betancourt et al uh, in uh, um, physical review letters 2008, in which they expanded multiple information as if it was a, a Taylor uh, series. We tried to introduce a conditioning operator and trying to expand the transfer entropy, which worked reasonably well, but on the other hand, for actual system uh, with many variables and the short time points doesn't scale very well. On the other hand, uh, some colleagues uh, a, a couple of years ago came out with a, a very uh, agile uh, way of uh, performing this expansion, which they call the uh, O information. So it's a, a higher order uh, expansion of mutual information. And uh, later on, we extended it also with a conditioning uh, operator. So uh, in this case, when should we stop? Uh, because of course, once we expand, we go from uh, a triplet to a quadruplet and so on, at a certain point, uh, we will have, uh, uh, we should stop. And we stop when the, the amount of synergy and redundancy in a multiplet, uh, let's say, becomes compatible with the one uh, of a, of a null distribution, in this case obtained either by bootstrap or by permutations. So uh, why I'm uh, telling you all this and why uh, uh, we could also say that I'm a bit obsessed with this. First of all, uh, synergy redundancy are, uh, in my opinion, a quite natural paradigm to study um, emergence in a wide sense and to encompass segregation and integration, which uh, at least at a large scale, uh, but also at a smaller scale, uh, in neural systems are uh, crucial. Then, uh, in this view, uh, redundancy speaks to uh, degeneracy. On the other hand, synergy speaks to cooperation of uh, amount degrees of freedom in our system. And talking about degrees of freedom and reduction in degrees of freedom, sometimes we want to reduce dimensionality. Uh, we use manifolds, uh, we process the data so, and uh, all these uh, operations can be seen under the lens of um, information theory and entropy, in particular of uh, entropy involving um, different uh, actors of a system. Uh, another important thing is that uh, when a system is completely disordered, then the information transfer is low. When the system is completely ordered, also information transfer is low because we don't need any more the driver to predict the target. The system is completely predictable. So the maximum of the information transfer should lie in the middle between the two. Uh, for mutual information in systems where we can exactly find a transition point. So in the case of the easing spins, we see that uh, the peak of mutual information is exactly uh, at the critical temperature. On the other hand, with transfer entropy, uh, it has been shown that the global transfer entropy of the system peaks in the paramagnetic phase, meaning that we can use the global transfer entropy as a precursor of the system. The problem with transfer entropy is that we need to compute it for all the system and for big systems uh, is a mess. On the other hand, using partial information decomposition, it can be seen that synergy is the informational quantity which acts as a precursor of transition towards order dynamics. So we don't need all the variables of the system. There was this uh, very recent uh, paper uh, which came out a couple of days ago uh, on dimensionality reduction. Uh, this one uh, is, uh, let's say, a pledge to go beyond the pairwise interactions. Uh, 
very nice work by Joe Lizier on uh, uh, emergency computation. Uh, and uh, yeah, uh, this is uh, again about uh, emergence in uh, plus computational biology uh, uh, a couple of months ago. And this is uh, our uh, five cents about uh, the, the precursor. So, and uh, I conclude with a few uh, neuronal applications, uh, biased, of course, a couple of work from me, but also from other colleagues. Uh, in this case, uh, we use uh, three classes of neurons which respond differently, which have different amounts of mutual information with respect to the, uh, to the outcome, in this case, to the choice of the monkey. It is uh, uh, from the Chiani lab, um, intracranial recordings, interneuronal recordings. And we see that indeed there is a class of uh, uh, neurons, in this case, the class L, which has basically zero mutual information uh, with, the, with the response. Indeed, the redundancy is zero. On the other hand, its synergy increases with the size of the multiple. On the other hand, the global synergy of the neurons, which are most uh, uh, correlated in terms of mutual information with the response, decrease with the size of the multiple. Uh, another example in which this decomposition can be useful is uh, when we um, uh, when we have variables which are very similar to each other. So in this case, two uh, hippocampal electrodes at the onset of epilepsy, which are very similar one to another. And if we look at the classical uh, uh, interaction information or transfer entropy, uh, we see a difference between the pre and the ictal phase, but we don't. Uh, find the difference between electrode 11 and ele electrode 12, which are the two candidate drivers of epilepsy. On the other hand, using partial information decomposition, uh, we are able to uh, perfectly disambiguate the fact that is electrode 12, which uh, sends unique information to the target when the target is the grid of electrodes uh, on the surface of the brain, and this is not the case for the other electrodes. Another application to uh, fMRI data from uh, uh, Nigel Kolenbeer, a student in, in my lab, former students, is uh, where we have the global signal and uh, the signal in the vessels, which are very correlated to, uh, to the limit of being indistinguishable. But we have a, a kind of a problem in uh, fMRI because we want to get rid of the physiological fluctuations, but not of the neuron information, but the global signal is by definition, the signal from all the brains. We want to keep at least part of it. And so despite being very much uh, correlated, we can see that uh, both using hemodynamic and calcium uh, recordings, we can uh, disambiguate the different contribution of the global signal and the signal from the vessels to different regions in the brain. Uh, other work includes uh, work of uh, Michael Weber and Joe Lizier, uh, Viola Prisman on uh, information storage in uh, predictive coding. Uh, very nice work on um, the whole framework of uh, mutual information and interaction information uh, by Robin Nins. And then uh, very elegant work using uh, genetics, uh, fMRI, electrophysiology by uh, Lupi et al, uh, which also came out a few months ago. So, uh, Thanks. I hope uh, I've been somehow uh, clear about why I care about this stuff. And uh, I'm looking forward to hear what you think about it. Thank you.